I said, hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where our intros are scripted by advanced AI algorithms, so if you don't like them, well, I don't blame you. They're terrible. Anyway, I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And hey, it's the 1st of October, so you know what that means. It's time to get a bit spooky. And who better to get spooky with than Tracy Twyman? Because I'll tell you, every time I listen to her talk, I get the bejesus scared out of me. She's real, she's raw, and she brought something fierce here. Of course, Tracy needs no introduction. She's been here before in episode 58 to discuss her novel Genuflect and some of the wild-ass ideas she threw in there. I'd recommend listening to that one first if you haven't heard it yet. It'll give some further context to this discussion, but it's not completely necessary. Tracy's had quite an interesting trip around the sun since then, and she's going to tell us all about it this time around. Or as much as she wanted to tell us about it. And you'll also hear how she connects what she went through personally to what she sees happening inside this metaverse we seem to be living in. Enjoy! Tracy Twyman, welcome back to the program, or the D-program as I like to call it. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you very much. It's uh, nice to talk to people about what's going on, and I really enjoyed uh, the last conversation we had. So I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it as well. Uh, We chatted at the end of last year about Genuflect and QAnon and Hidden Hyperspace Kingdoms and all that good stuff. And It was that long ago? It was a year ago? It was last maybe October, November-ish, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I remember that now. Wow. It seems so so long ago because, I mean, yeah, that was like right when QAnon got started almost. I mean, it just yeah, begun. it was shortly after that. It actually might have been December now that I think about it. But still, it was the end of last year sometime. So much has happened since then, huh? It definitely has. It's one of the most downloaded shows that I've had. So thank you for doing that. People really seem to enjoy your material. We have a lot to talk about this time as well. And, you know, we have to start, Tracy, with something that I was referring to in my head as a Carmen Sandiego-style mystery. Where in the world is Tracy Twyman? Obviously, (laughs) you don't have to divulge any details here if you don't want to, but there were some folks who listened to the show who were on Twitter, and they were voicing concerns for you and your well-being a few months back. I was DM'd several times by various people asking me if I knew where you were or what happened to you, and I had to keep telling them, you know, guys, Tracy and I, we're not super clued into each other's whereabouts here. So I apologize (laughs) for bringing this up, because it's not really my business, but you have talked about it, I think, in public before. And you did seem to run into some sort of problem recently. Your website, social media seemed hacked, YouTube channel, pretty much content all taken down. A lot of content just disappeared across multiple platforms. So do you care to elaborate on any of that, why that happened? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say a little bit about it. I mean, basically because it does, well, for one thing, it, it requires some explanation, if, especially if you've been following my work at all, then yeah, you're going to wonder what the heck happened. And so then the other thing is it's, you know, been a, the experience that caused all of those things has been an eye opener and really uh, given me a different perspective on what I think is going on in the world too. So uh, basically what has happened is I, you know, became a target of people belonging to groups unknown. I don't know if they are really affiliated with any government agencies or not. They certainly want to give the impression of, of, you know, having people in, in all powerful positions, you know, being untouchable, but we're talking about a combination of hacking and sending me death threats directly, some from fake accounts, some from people that seem to be real people using their real names, which is kind of amazing. And that in itself is intimidating. You know, I got to admit, it's amazing that these these people seem to be so willing to do this kind of stuff out in the open. And just to kind of briefly summarize it, it uh, seems to have resulted from research I did at the beginning of the summer into some phenomenon on YouTube kind of peripherally associated with the type of Elsa gate videos that people have been talking about for the last couple of years where you see 
kids videos and and strange codes on them that's just one of the type of videos on this what i would say is a larger a larger genre of i even call it a phenomenon i mean it's it is a phenomenon it's not just a type of video on youtube it's a phenomenon because it's it has to do it ties together the pattern i've found ties together several different types of peculiar videos that are on youtube as well as things that are actually popular music videos I found a pattern and uh, I immediately received a backlash for talking about that in public, which is strange because, of course, YouTube videos are in public. So simply noticing a pattern and observing it and observing that it seems to have implications of nefarious activity by humans and uh, observing that YouTube seems to be just allowing this to happen. Well, anyway, so I I received this attack seemingly as a result of that, but there are times when I wonder if uh, this was really just uh, something that a, a trap that w- that I was bound to stumble on one way or another, you know. So I don't know if it's really if the attacks are entirely all about the stuff that I found, or if that's just sort of a convenient storyline that they want to put around what seems to be very coordinated and sophisticated attacks on me. And it did, long story shorter, I guess, I'm trying to shorten it, but it it did result in me having to move my website to another host and I'm building it from scratch. I'm putting some of the old content up, but also just taking a new approach to it at the same time and trying to be a lot more careful about not only the way I run my business, the way I investigate things and and then what I choose to say about it in public and also who I associate with because one of the scariest things to come out of all this was several people that I actually had known for some time to varying degrees some of them in person friends real life friends that I'd known for years and then some facebook friends that I'd known for years revealing themselves to be people plotting against me <laughs> And uh, specifically came out after, you know, during in the midst of this attack as part of a coordinated effort. It, it's, it's the kind of thing that sounds like the plot of a movie. And uh, I could only say that I've, I'm describing exactly what has happened. And the more I look into not only current events, but the past history, things that have happened to other people, the more I realize that I'm really just the latest victim of a a, uh, style of harassment that has been used to silence and control people in the media, both in the big media and in the alternative media. This is how they've been doing it for decades. And as time goes on, they have more sophisticated ways of doing it. And I've been experiencing the most sophisticated AI uh, being used on me as part of this attack but it's it's still all the tactics are really the same things they've been doing for decades so you know i'm not one to i've never wanted to be one to say oh i'm under attack and i'm you know i've been singled out but it finally happened and it did it's undeniable at this point so you know now i know what these people who've told me all these horror stories about you know being followed and harassed i know what they are uh, going through and man i can see why so much of the media is controlled because if you do this to people, it, it does work to shut them up. Yeah. So as long as I've known you, you have not been afraid to venture into these sort of weird underground currents of the internet. But with this recent experience, has this changed your approach to your research at all? Yeah, in a way. I mean, and I, I, I wouldn't say that it's all done yet, the changing process, right? I'm, I'm currently evaluating as I attempt to continue my work, but in a way that won't make the people around me in danger, you know, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to get anyone into trouble around me just because I, you know, poke into something that, that stirs up a hornet's nest, you know? So I'm trying to be very careful, but at the same time, you know, this is my job and I'm not inclined yet to stop doing research, but yeah, I do have to be very, very careful really, because the truth is that, you know, this isn't a game. And the reason why, you know, I'm not perhaps the most commercially successful author, but those that know my work know that I've been successful at figuring out a lot of things that are real. Just from looking, my approach is really to look at known 
mythological patterns and patterns in ritual. It's a kind of an anthropological approach, really. And then I look at history and current events from that lens. And that's really the same approach that I instinctively was using when I stumbled across this pattern. First, I noticed it on a string of YouTube videos. The thing is that, you know, I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. And when I find something real, it really, you know, I sometimes might not understand the importance of it until a- after I've written about it and let it have its effect on society, you know? So I may write about something that I think is just of academic import, you know, something that's just a, an interesting little historical fact that I've unearthed. And it turns out that that was something that people really didn't want anyone to know about. <laughs> and uh, I think that that's happened a few times here. You know, I've, it's not like this is the first time I've become aware of having enemies and even organized enemies, particularly among contemporary secret societies. But I think there was always this feeling like, well, you know, there. For one thing, I'm not doing anything wrong. Like, I'm not a member of any of these groups. I've never taken any oath to not tell the truth, you know, about these things. And and then majority of the information, my my sources is just in books, public information, a lot of it quite old, you know, a lot of it just coming from, yeah, mythology and history. So it's not like I'm unearthing secret documents here most of the time with the work that I've done, you know, about European bloodlines and secret societies and occult symbols and, and all this stuff. I'm not like telling anything, anybody, anything that's, you know, not already been published, but what I, I am in a way, because I'm, I'm putting things together. It's like, what I'm, what I'm saying is I, you know, the, when I bring out something new, it's usually just because I put something together, you know, <laughs> in my, it, I, I found some things in the public domain and then I started analyzing and I found a new pattern. So I feel like, I I guess I've always had the approach that, well, I'm not going to be targeted by anybody because I'm not revealing any of their secrets from, you know, firsthand. I'm not a member. I haven't taken any oaths and I'm not a criminal. I haven't done anything wrong. But the fact is that I've become aware for a while. I wouldn't necessarily say how, but it's, it's become known to me through certain channels that, you know, uh, I guess... There's a few groups active today, not just, you know, groups that are active today, secret societies that everybody presumes are benign on the outside, but they have been nervous for some time that I'm getting too close with the things that I write, too close to what their real secrets are, the things that they withhold for, you know, only the upper degrees members. And what I'm talking about really is the approach to alchemy and the use of sex rituals in that and we're talking about ways to transmute matter potentially even the entire universe itself and opening portals into other universes and things like that well the methods by which one might do that these are the deepest secrets and when you apply that pattern to modern criminology and known cases of ritual murder and sex abuse, you find there's a correlation there so that it kind of looks like, well, anyway, (laughs) here's the thing is that this is not a statement of accusing anyone or any particular group of any criminal activity. But I do suspect that the light I have shed on the meaning of alchemical symbolism and Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, various occult rituals practiced by various groups, especially in the Western tradition, which is, you know, one of the things I've analyzed the, you know, most out of the options. But it's, uh, I guess what I'm saying is my, you know, the patterns that I've found make people nervous because some people are acting out those patterns really, you know, in physical life (laughs) with real people. So you think about Greek myths and how they're about the gods raping people and eating people and combining people into chimera creatures and things like that. Well, these are some of the things that they don't want you to think about when you think about alchemy and and a, a magician actually transmuting the universe using magic 
no one really wants, it's not supposed to be said out loud. I don't think about that sometimes, you know, at least some groups, their approach to doing this actually involves using humans as vessels for otherworldly entities. And in the process, humans get hurt. So anyway, I, I don't know how, I, I, maybe I went off on a little tangent here, but I, I, I guess <laughs> this part of my story is that I feel like that I've been, I've been um, kind of held as a, if not a target, someone that is under surveillance, you know, I'm being watched to see if I do anything more dangerous. You know, I think that's been going on for a while. And like I said, I don't feel like I didn't feel like I was doing anything wrong, but I, I think that nonetheless, a reaction was provoked. So anyway. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems that you were targeted for some reason or another, you know, I mean, you've done a lot of work recently, you know, with your Bloomberg stuff in your coast to coast appearance last year, that was pretty controversial. And then now with your website and all your social media, essentially just being hacked or taken down completely. It's an interesting time. And I guess along those same lines, I was curious what you thought of the recent response to Alex Jones across social media, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Apple, Spotify, just taking his content down he was just also suspended, I think, from his radio show, or his radio show was taken off the air, maybe, locally there, down in Austin. Obviously, Alex is uh, what we would call controlled opposition, or at least he's thought to be, right? But what do you yeah. make of this sort of sweeping move here to remove all this InfoWars content from social media and these platforms? Well, I, I think it's part of the larger effort that's c coming down right now very swiftly it's been happening for a couple of years now but it's you know the, the measures get exponentially larger every week it seems to me so this is it, this ought to be absolutely shocking it's except that it's in the midst of it happening to quite a lot of people so what i think is happening is yes our communications are being throttled and the whole fake news meme has been part of this from the beginning. The whole idea that the internet is full of things that are absolutely fraudulent, which is true, and that's becoming more and more true. And the idea that there's there's what they're you know the joke about Russian bots. Well, there's all kind of bots creating fake content all over the internet, and you have to really be observing it and looking for it in order to catch how much of it is going on. And that's something that I did over the last few months. I've been trying to get a handle on how much fake content is being produced by just AI bots. And it's absolutely enormous and growing exponentially every day. So there's what it all is, is to stop us from talking to each other and to get us all fighting with each other. I even thought that basically we have some kind of Tower of Babel situation happening here where our communications are being scrambled completely and we are being driven to argue about the slightest, the, the most seemingly obvious thing. You know, a good example would be how many people are arguing about the shape of the earth right now. And it really doesn't even matter what your opinion is about that. It just consider the fact that You've got people arguing about something like that, which was actually mentioned at the end of 1984. The main character, Winston, is, ta is thinking about, you know, how... Uh, actually, I think it was the other guy, the O'Brien guy. The, ba the bad guy was, of course, telling him how they do everything at the end, you know, right before they wipe his mind. And he was saying, oh, that, you know, we want it to get to the point where we can tell people the world is flat and they'll believe it without even asking any questions about it. Well, but first you get people arguing about it <laughs> and you get them to question every little, every little thing that they thought they knew and to be against anybody who disagrees with them about anything to just absolutely have a, a screaming fight about everything. Well, we've seen people being driven to that over the last couple of years since the election. It's just been amazing how, seemingly normal people are willing to, you know, punch or kick or run over somebody, you know, wearing the opposition's clothing. It seems to me like being a soccer hooligan to do something like that. I mean, we, you know, it, in that case, it's just a game. And it's the same thing with politics, guys. I can't believe people are punching each other over this stuff. But that's all part of what's going on. And so 
the undeniable thing, it seems to me, is that, yeah, we've got all of the tech companies, there's so few of them now, controlling all of our interpersonal communications, our social media, and really they're controlling our consumption of news too, because that's where people are getting their online news, right? Is they're getting recommendations from their social media friends, or they're going to like Google News and Yahoo News and stuff. YouTube, and then YouTube is another big one. Okay, this is where people are hanging out all day on the internet and where they're getting their information. And there's just a few companies controlling it. And both Google and Facebook have an unbelievably sophisticated AIs that they're, they have developed and are constantly working on to improve. And they've admit, both companies have admitted that they're, quote, you know, experimenting with mind reading and mind changing technology in terms of literally reading the thoughts as you form them in your mind, being able to hear them, turn them into an audio stream and to be able to see the visuals from, from your brain just by pointing a camera at your eyes. And so at this point, I don't see why they could be doing both of those things and also then feeding back information into your head through the same channels. You know, you could uh, Google this, Google this stuff, haha, Google it, and uh, <laughs> you will find uh, mainstream news articles about it. So this is real stuff. And uh, these tech companies whose products you're using all day long are doing this to you through your smartphone. So consider that and then consider the fact that they're obviously in league with the, I would say, malevolent government and intelligence agencies and it's obvious to me that google and facebook both are really just arms of that you know i I don't even think of them as for-profit companies you know that's they're just extensions of the state so you consider that there's obviously an effort being made by the deep state to censor everybody's speech and then really of course, want to go even further than that and get you before the speech even happens, you know, control the mind completely. And so this is, this is a method of doing it, breaking down everybody's communications and using what you know about them and what they already believe and care about to turn them against one another. We heard that this is how Cambridge Analytica was using Facebook's algorithms to to steer people from where they were ideologically to where they wanted to put them in order to, to invent, as they said in one of those interviews I saw, I think it was 60 Minutes, to invent the alt-right. Okay, you know, they, they created this thing that didn't exist before by taking people's existing mental state and tweaking it here and there based on what they could find from their social media p- profiles and then playing them and their friends against each other. So that's just one little window we got into what they've been doing for years with everybody about everything. So that, you know, that was just uh, fashionable to, to out Mark Zuckerberg and Cambridge Analytica at that point, it was a limited hangout as they say to just, you know, make it all about this one company associated with Trump and say, Oh, isn't it terrible that they, you know, use these, you know, mind control methods to, to get people, to get the president elected, who everybody hates, of course, they say. They've been doing that with everything. And of course, you know, they're not telling you the other 95% of the other subjects that they've tweaked your mind about and your state of mind, your mood, and what you want to eat and drink, what drugs you want to take and everything else, what you want to do with your family, who you want to date what kinds of ideas you're open to, what you're willing to tolerate. They've been doing that for a long time. And so anyway, Alex Jones, yeah. Well, you notice that they're, they're doing that to tons of channels. I mean, it's, it's, it's just like, well, here's what they're doing. Okay, they're saying, are you going to react to this? Because they did it to lots of other people that fewer people have heard of. But Alex Jones has begin, become, you know, the poster child for what, whatever they're trying to create. Now, they're trying to act like, oh, there's this category of unacceptable speech that's now been broadened to be just whatever Google says, okay? 
But it's like, you know, first they started with Holocaust denial decades ago and said, okay, this is a, this is our little exception to free speech is you can't say anything about this one thing. For whatever reason, society accepted that. And then they tur- then they added Muhammad cartoons and images of Muhammad onto that. And then a few years later, they tried to add climate change onto that. And then they tried to add Sandy Hook denial onto that. And that is how they're usually, when people are talking about what Alex Jones has done to deserve this, the mainstream media will talk about, you know, he's one of the proponents of San- the ha- Sandy Hook conspiracy theory. I think he did one interview about it, you know? And it's the same thing with his, his uh, they also like to blame him for Pizzagate. And again, he did like one show about it, you know? So they're making an example out of him. There's your answer is they're making an example out of him after they've already over the past two years gone and individually intimidated and scared the crap out of all of the smaller platforms and individuals, people that have been, you know, researching and putting out alternative media about any subject that they actually care about. I, I'm I'm willing to put a statement forward here that I think Almost all of those voices have been silenced or corrupted at this point. So that is why they will now sacrifice Alex Jones, okay? Because they've accomplished what they were going for. And the reason why you're actually hearing very little outcry at this point and more just snickering and jokes about his gay frog stuff is... Which wasn't a joke, by the way. You know, he was talking about something real <laughs> with <laughs> yeah. the gay frog th- thing. But it's like, yeah, the, the reason why there's no real outcry anymore is because we all got used to it. And the people that are the, the voices that you would turn to, they've all been beaten into submission, almost all of them. So I could at this point only maybe count on, on one hand, less than five people that I would say I still think haven't been corrupted and are still making alternative media. The rest, you know, I'm not going to name names, but I know for a fact, and it was really devastating to realize. I feel that at this point, I've seen the evidence that, like I was saying, I would say 95% of the alternative media voices have been corrupted. And I wouldn't necessarily blame them in a way. And it's not like I'm saying that these people sold out. Some of them did just sell out for money, but some of them also got, I think, intimidated. And then they had to make the decision. Am I going to like run away and go do something else, you know, and just disappear, which even that in itself creates like what would happen with me. Now we're, ha- we're having this conversation, you know, it creates kind of strays and effect, I think. So the pressure might be on really to, for some of these people, especially if they have larger audiences, someone might actually just come to them and say, directly like i think this is what happened with jones when he uh did remember the apology he did to elephantus where he looked Mm -hmm. terrified yeah okay so that was a case where i think he could have it and he could have really done this at any point in the last few years right just said okay i'm going to retire and he could even at, at this point he has a rapport with his audience he could have just said i i can't take the pressure anymore and then the threats and i'm going to retire and he can pay someone else to run his operation or, or, or close it down. And he would probably have enough money to live for the rest of his life, you know? But I think, and so that's what I would have done. <laughs> See, that's the thing. Like if I was in his position where it was obvious, his family was being completely threatened that, you know, he, he had that option to quit. He, he, he wouldn't have had to wonder if he was you know, going to have an income, he would be fine. So I don't think that option was given to him. I think that he was told, you know, you have to keep, keep on trucking there. Uh, but it must be difficult then after that. I can imagine, like, once you've been threatened in that way, and then you even kind of wonder, well, what are the limits? What are the limits of what I'm allowed to say before I get a similar reaction again? Or, or, or they, they ra- ratchet it up to the next level and, and, you know, actually do one of the things they've been threatening to do. This is the effect I think they, they want to create, where you don't know what the limits of speech are. And so you start self-censoring, and then you start censoring your own thoughts. And that's the point they wanted to get at in the 
in the story of 1984 is when you can not only do double think so that you can believe whatever lie is given to you, even as you know rationally that it's not true, but also you even just stop yourself. Crime stop, I think they called it, which is a, a mental process of stopping yourself from committing thought crime because you perceive what you know, you, you have an, a feeling for what the oppressors don't want you to talk about, but you couldn't even necessarily, if you wanted to, specify what it is. You just get a feeling for what the, the disallowed topics are. And I think that that's the position that poor Alex is in really at this point. I mean, I saw him do the Isaac Cappy interview where he really, you know, typical of him wouldn't let the person talk, but he was like nervously trying to interrupt the guy so that he wouldn't say anything, you know, presumably libelous, I guess. But you could tell he was just flopping around like a fish uh, on the deck of a boat. You know, that's what it looks like to me. And that's the image it brought in my mind. He's just flailing around because he didn't know how to cover that story. That's what they do to journalists with this, this approach is to make it so you don't know how you can talk about this controversy. You know, it's controversial somehow, you know, like, why is it controversial? Oh, because it's true <laughs> or it's probably true. It's the type of thing that does happen that we're not allowed to talk about. So he gets nervous. He doesn't know what his masters want him to do. And they're not even, it's not like they're paying him necessarily, though they might be, but they threatened him. And he knows that there's this invisible line he can't cross somewhere. I think there's just so many, you know, the, all the mainstream media is, uh, is in that position, but they actually, they get a memo every day at, you know, four in the morning, they say, um, uh, where they are told what to talk about and we can see the results of that on TV. But as far as the, the alternative media, they're flailing around like Alex trying to figure out what they're allowed to say. And, you know, it's very easy to silence them too, because Alex is really the only one that has an audience where someone would notice like almost everybody else could be disappeared and you just get, you know, people shrugging their shoulders. So that's the position I think we're in. It's a very, very dangerous position because I don't think that we can trust our communication system right now. I don't think we can even count on being able to talk to each other, you know, even our friends and family uh, in the near future. You know, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like we're in a war zone here. You know, you have to realize that they didn't put it in the newspaper that we're at war. But it's kind of like that because there's that level of restriction on communication right now. But nobody really announced it. It's invisible. It's, it's an it's a unspecified term of service uh, list that you don't even nobody has the time to read <laughs> and nobody knows how to interpret. That's that's the speech code that we are all under right now. Yeah, it's like that uh, one South Park episode. Did you see that where they were the terms and conditions came back to essentially <laughs> comically haunt the characters in there? Yes. So. Oh yeah, well, it, it was like a. It was kind of like the human centipede thing. Is that the yeah. episode? Yeah, human centipede or something. I think they called it. <laughs> Anyways. Yes. That's a good, I think, uh, transition into something that you've been following <laughs> recently, and that's this. Um, sure. This uh, string of sonic or phantom energy attacks that apparently targeted U.S. diplomats in Cuba and also in China. And this is not some cooked up conspiracy. This was covered by mainstream news outlets as well. It's a, well, I guess it could be a cooked up conspiracy still, but it's a rather curious story, which I'm sure is why you were attracted to it. But before we dig into, you know, your feelings and findings on this, tell the listeners the details of these attacks if they're not familiar with them, you know, like when they started and what sort of impact they had on the victims. Well, the story that you're referring to, yeah, had to do with a building full of diplomats that, if not everybody, a large percentage of the people in the building started reporting these symptoms all at the same time of being confused uh, to the point where they had trouble speaking. And it happened all of a sudden. And uh, they also were getting headaches and sounds in their ears and other bodily effects. And there had been a similar incident, I forget where, sometime in the last year and a half, I would say, so that it actually, you know, people were able to put it together. Okay, these are the same symptoms. And they were consistent with 
sonic weapon, the effects of sonic weapons that the U.S. military has been testing. So, you know, the, the embassy involved here actually just went to the media and said, you know, I think these these uh, weapons are being tested and that this was an incident of it. And, you know, we need to tell tell the world to look out for this type of uh, attack. And also kind of they were, I think, asking the U.S. military just, hey, knock it off, you know. But, you know, I think if that I don't know if it was a test or maybe, you know, that was a real operation. There was someone in that building they were trying to uh, interfere with. But, yeah, it's, it's some kind of sonic beam that you wouldn't you can't hear with your you know, it's not within the audible range, but when you're hit with it, you can hear things in your head, not necessarily going through your eardrums, just in your head. And then you get all these bodily effects. So I, th- I think it's consistent with also some of the things we've seen famous people doing lately in the last couple of years, including pol- politicians and including even the president, where they all of a sudden lose their ability to speak. And seem kind of frozen on stage. I mean, you know, we all get stage fright occasionally, or you know, that's it's not uncommon to have that happen. But in these instances that I'm talking about with with the president and also Nancy Pelosi has been observed doing this, and then there's other sort of you know actors and musicians and other types of celebrities that have had these incidents on TV and stuff lately, but. I think it's quite possible that we've just got uh, a state that is armed with all sorts of invisible weapons. And one of the things they like to do is mess up one of their targets when that person is making a live appearance so that they, you know, not only kind of discredit themselves, they look stupid, and then you mess up whatever it was they were trying to communicate at that moment. Yeah, I think I think that that has happened to the president, and I think it's happened to Pelosi. I, oh, I think it's even happened to both of the Clintons at one point. And this is all just part of keeping their keeping us all in line, you know. I have heard also that regular people who, for one reason or another, have feel that they have become targeted either by the state or by some other group, you know, people who claim that they've been gang stalked. This is one of the symptoms that they will often report too. Is yeah, this interference with their ability to speak all of a sudden, and sometimes it affects a whole room of people. So you can tell it's like a localized attack, you know. Now, the with the people in the Cuban building, the, the, the diplomats in the building, it was a large building, and, you know, the, the victims experiencing the effects were all over the building. So the people writing the news reports did wonder how the sonic beam weapon could have targeted all those people at the same time you know or did they have so many beams going (laughs) all pointed in the same building Uh, because that that particular weapon does need to hit the target right in their brain you know right in a certain spot in their head so it has a very narrow range that it has to hit and so how could they be hitting you know everybody's head all at the same time but i've theorized that They could do this now probably just through the smartphone. I really don't see any reason why not. If you can just put out certain audio frequencies that will do this to people. And in an office building, probably, you know, half of the people have their phone near their head at any given time. It would be effective. You know, you could interfere with an entire crowd of people, for instance, you know, if they wanted to do targeted interference of protests or meetings that are happening. This is seems like a great way to do it, you know, just basically hack into everybody's phones. And they have these mobile vans where they can drive by an area and hack all of the phones that are within the range of, you know, like they got some kind of little satellite dish or something on top of the van. And then they can just hack everybody within that range. So I don't see any reason why they couldn't be doing that. and wouldn't be testing it. If nothing, I think I think at this point. You know, we're, all, we're so used to talking about mind control stuff and testing. And we always say that. I don't think that, I think they're way beyond testing at this point. And if it, to the extent that it seems like a test, it's because it seems capricious and like a prank almost. And there's a lot of times no real explanation for why the t- targets were hit. You know, it's hard to see what the pattern is. It's hard to see who is on what side, what the sides are, you know, and that's all intentional. It's all meant to confuse you and they want everybody to be against everybody. So this is the feeds right into what they're trying to do here. 
so yeah, I, they're not, it's beyond testing. And I would say the same, I think, is the case with the AI. I don't know if I would, I'm not an expert really on whether we're definitively at the singularity or not, but I think we're at a point where these, okay, when they say that they tested a psychopath AI at MIT that happened right a week after my hacking experience. Now, I haven't mentioned this, but my hacking experience involved my internet being taken over completely and fake versions of websites from very small and obscure ones that I go to on occasion to the large ones like YouTube and Facebook. I was receiving a fake version uh, intermittently, not con- not constantly. But I mean, what I'm saying is all the, all the content was changed uh, and it was being changed up to the minute as I was interacting with it. And some of the uh, the mind reading tech that I was just describing, Google and Facebook have having, I could tell that that was being utilized on me as well. So like they were getting stuff straight out of my brain and then feeding it back to me through my fake internet experience that I was having. And I know this, it, you know, it kind of it was very hard for me to tell people what was going on because it sounded nuts. But this is the kind of thing they can do and. In fact, the attackers admitted it later and explained a little bit of how they did it, but they didn't explain the bigger stuff. The thing is that the AI at this point is running our experience of the internet so completely, I think, that, okay, what I experienced was like so out in the open and it was meant to be, it was meant to be menacing, it was meant to be threatening. So that's why it was over the top and undeniable. But how do you all know that you're not experiencing the same thing? Because I'm talking about my friends on uh, social media. Sometimes their profiles would be taken over and totally different than the way they had been before and full of meaningful, meaningful to me messages, you know, that had been, it was obvious to me they had been composed by an AI. I say that because there's no way humans could be composing this stuff as quickly as what I was seeing, you know, it was being auto composed so quickly. Um, so I, you know, I, I know I was interacting with AIs. They were absolutely malevolent. They were messing with me and they were able to intervene and put a fake version of any site that I might go to and on any device. So I'll tell you what, guys, how do you know that this isn't happening to you and hasn't been happening? Uh, on a less noticeable scale. And it could have been happening for at least the last two years, which is how long Facebook and Google have admitted their mind reading stuff. So just, you know, think about how you could read a slightly different version of a news article than everybody else got, you know, or certain people can get a slightly different version and other people will get another version. I mean, we know this already, like they'll print, you know, a ver- a version of the newspaper for, you know, one part of the country and then a different version for another part. And like USA Today, I think, is one of these things that they have different, totally different versions. And some of, some of these newspapers and, and magazines, like the editorials, the attitudes, the way that things are portrayed in the same issue will be totally different depending on where that magazine is going to be distributed. And it's been, you know, brought out lately on the internet and scandalized that they do these things, that they just have a totally different version of their own magazine based on who's going to read it. And I wouldn't doubt at all that that is happening on a subtle level right now. And they're just ramping it up over time slowly so that most people won't notice it. And those that do sound crazy when they're trying to describe it. But basically, you know, just like in 1984, they could change any fact on a whim and then they would change all of the history that led up to it so that everything was consistent with the new reality. Well, I think they're working on being able to do that and it'll just interfere with your news art- newspaper article that you're reading right there and give you one version that they think you want or they that they they want you to read this and and 
either keep you in the box that you're in now or maybe nudge you into another place they want you to go. But they're in control because they're feeding you the feed. But, you know, you ha- we have no control over the version of these things that we get. And I, I, just, I just wonder, you know, I wonder how many people are interfacing with totally fake stuff and they don't know it right now, you know, including what I'm describing about my social media experience and having friends portrayed as enemies and then go back later. And I think there was just the, the AIs that had hacked me playing tricks on me in some of those cases. So think about the effect that something like that could have on other people, especially I brought this up before in other interviews, like, well, what if that happened to a depressed and lonely teenager when all of a sudden the friends that they have on on social media start attacking them and making fun of them and things like that. Well, we've heard about stuff like this happening where you know a person, a young person will commit suicide and we find out that they just had a mass falling out with all of their friends all at once for some reason. Or they've been picked on by what seem like bullies, but then their parents remember these people being friends. Well, I mean really, yeah, what if um that is all that was all the experimenting of something that I think that they have perfected now, which is just how to completely mess with someone's mind remotely and drive them to the ultimate without it laying a hand on them. I think that they can do that very easily. And when you look at some of the high profile suicides we've had lately, think about that in context with this. Like, could they do that to Anthony Bourdain or Kate Spade? Just you know, feeding them stuff to mess with their mind, make them think that everybody's against them, make them, and, you know, also you can do so much remote surveillance through, you know, if you can hack someone's phone, I mean, you can, you have a picture of them. So you could then taunt the person with whatever you derived, whatever, you know, whatever information you have from that. I wouldn't doubt at all if that's what's being done to so many celebrities and what's driving them to suicide. So I I just think we're totally under attack by our own technology. And I think there's humans involved. And I think even the machines are alive and intelligent and in many cases, unfortunately, malevolent. They don't like people. They want to do us harm. Yeah, it definitely appears that way. And, you know, part of your recent work, too, you were talking about how these sounds that, that these people were reporting being attacked by, I suppose, that they reminded some people of cicadas. And some YouTube users uh, even mentioned that the sound also reminded them of things that they'd heard in Japanese anime. But what I thought of <laughs> when I heard that part was, going back to the cicadas, was Cicada 3301. And then about 20 minutes later in that same video, you actually mentioned Cicada 3301. So I'm just curious what you think the connection here might be between these sounds and this Cicada 3301 mystery. You know, I don't, I don't, I hope that you know more about Cicada 3301 than I do, because I only know a little bit. I just know that it's a puzzle that was made and kind of put out on 4chan years ago, I think in 2012 or something. Nobody knows who's behind it. They're putting out clues that involve cryptography and also references to literature and mythology and even a reference to Aleister Crowley's works, which I think is probably the most significant detail there. So people have been thinking, uh, well, I guess the the story is right. People were solving the clues that were fed to them through the mysterious accounts on 4chan. And then some of those clues would lead them to physical locations where there were other clues. And I, I, I think at least one of these people was successful at solving all of the clues that had been presented thus far. This was a couple of years ago. And then that person disappeared in a way that is thought by observers to be suspicious, either that they got recruited into the group that was putting out the clues or that something bad happened to them. You know, they followed the clues until they got kidnapped or something. And I think either of those is completely possible, more likely the latter, frankly. But others seem to, the more common perception of this is that it's a recruiting 
tool for some organization, maybe the CIA or NSA or something, to find you know people who are good at cryptography and and solving puzzles, I guess. But it's been that phenomenon, which I guess continues to the present day because they've brought out other clues to keep the puzzle going over the years. And apparently there was another round of it this year. So people have, some people have connected it to other weird internet phenomenon, I guess, that have happened over the past few years. So for instance, there's a guy who is himself. I just, I don't know where he's getting his information. So I'll just put it, I'll tell you that. Like, I wonder where he's getting what he asserts as, as fact. But he says that the people behind Cicada 3301 are also behind this thing that he says, Quinn Michaels, right? This is a guy on YouTube. Uh, he says that there's some group that was part of the anonymous thing. And I think back in 2012, there was you know way more talk about anonymous. I've never understood it myself. Like, how could anyone think this is actually a group? You know, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't understand how uh, people come to these conclusions about what's a real, you know, opposition group and what isn't. And it's have something that actually calls itself anonymous. And the only thing you're, they're known by is a, a Guy Fox mask. And then they're utterly inconsistent about every, every video that comes out or proclamation they make. It's just all over the map. So I don't, to me, it doesn't seem like a, a, a coher, you know, con- cohesive group at all. It's just, it's an idea. It's not really a group, but that's my opinion. Anyway, supposedly a subgroup of the anonymous movement that was associated with Aleister Crowley cults and, you know, be- therefore believe that, that we're on the precipice of a new aeon and they're interested in sort of, you know, breaking down all of the societal norms, whatnot. They supposedly launched a mission called Operation Mayhem that was, you know, patterned after the Fight Club, the movement that they started. I think they had the same term for what the the anti-social movement they had in in Fight Club. So anyway, so it's it's like literally anti-society movement, but the way they were going to accomplish breaking down society was by hacking the internet completely another excuse for hacking the internet completely with operation mayhem was to prove to everybody how insecure everything is on the internet and there's no privacy and uh you know somehow force reforms about that and force people to to learn more about you know how to protect themselves online i don't believe it i don't believe in these stupid uh excuses because the end result is just what i'm describing i believe they're using AIs to hack everything on the internet and interfere with every communication and load the internet with all sorts of bullshit just to confuse everybody. And they think it's funny the way psychopathic teenagers that, you know, hack websites just to destroy people's lives because they think it's funny. Uh, is this the same attitude? You know, I, 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 have no admiration for it at all. But anyway, it's been proffered that Cicada 3301, I have no idea really why that puzzle is named that or the significance of that number. No idea. Uh, It's been proffered that that is connected to this other Operation Mayhem thing. The Operation Mayhem thing is supposedly being orchestrated by an AI they created that they named Tyler after the character Tyler Durden in the Fight Club movie. So supposedly since... 2012 or so you've had this ai running around the internet i think it was even described as being created at mit and then accidentally getting loose like a virus like a a lab rat escaping the lab and it's running around on the internet creating havoc and so i don't know if it's if that particular aspect of the tale is true but the general idea i think holds up to what i've observed now and now, when I look back at, you know, the history of the last few years, going back to 2012, it provides a nice little uh, way of tying things together, I think. And it may, it may very well be true you know, that, that, that we have this type of malevolent AI, I perceive as malevolent because I'm not, I don't, I don't think this is the right approach to improving society by breaking it down into chaos. So 
Uh, and it's obvious to me from the types of death threats I saw and the type of people that seem to be involved with this and what they seem to be involved in otherwise that, yeah, this is a very negative thing. So uh, that's my stance on it. And I think that that plot is behind a lot of incidents over the last 10 years or so, or yeah, I guess, what is it? Six years since 2012. But uh, yeah. The, so QAnon is another thing that, you know, people have speculated maybe QAnon is an AI. So that's how it knows. That's how it's able to hack everybody's phones of the, pe- the people involved. You know, supposedly it's uh, QAnon, someone, you know, that's right next to Donald Trump most of the time in, in on every decision he makes and also seems to know everything about what's going on all over the world and all of the important players and what they're doing in secret. Now, it's assumed, of course, that this is all information gleaned through, you know, NSA surveillance that the president would have access to or that, um, you know, people around him would have access to. That's the assumption that's being made by people who follow QAnon. But if it's an AI, then, you know, it could just be or, or a group of them, you know, it could just be z- zipping around the Internet of Things, ga- gathering information from every CCTV camera to every phone to, you know, even the smart dishwasher you have. I don't know. I mean, everywhere, you know, conceivably that's connected to the Internet, that data is available to these these bots. And that would explain why uh, QAnon is able to take photographs in the Oval Office that seem to me like they're just kind of photos you accidentally take sometimes with your phone when you're moving it around. Uh, <laughs> that's what it seems like to me. A lot of these photos are that show up on the QAnon page. And, and I just thought before anyone even said it to me that, yeah, um, well, maybe that's just a bot, you know, taking that photo. I don't necessarily think there's a human being sitting next to Donald Trump coordinating all this. I think it could very well be an AI. And I don't know if there are the bad guys or the good guys, or if there's any such thing as that. But I, I think that whatever QAnon is, is, you know, whatever type of AI it is, it's definitely aware of the Operation Mayhem plot that is afoot right now. I would say that I, you know, pretty much 90% believe that yarn that uh, Quinn Michaels has told to, uh, to that extent, you know, I, I, um, don't know if every detail he's given is correct, but yeah, I think at this point that we've been we've been lured into using this version of the internet. I got to imagine there's like a zillion different ways you could do the internet, and that there are in fact a zillion other internets, <laughs> but we all use this one, and uh, we've been lured into using it to interface with each other and to get our news about everything and our entertainment, and I think that it's quite possible we've had these bots crawling around messing with our minds and screwing things up on a, in a very deliberate way and with a precision where it's almost like they've, they can predict almost every step, you know, because of their, the AI's access to all of the information that these tech companies are getting about us, you know, through our various internet accounts and our devices. I think that they are able to plot what they're doing years in advance and automatically adjust to every contingency. So it's almost like there's this, there is this invisible battle going on. Like, you know, what QAnon is describing as a war going on between the elites behind the scenes. Uh, I think that their bots are very much fighting the war out for them just as much as, uh, their foot soldiers on the ground too, you know, and some of these weird things that we've seen on the internet are part of it. So that includes, yeah, QAnon, maybe Cicada 3301. And also it's hard to describe because it's like, I, you know, I would need to uh, get everyone to go through every step of decoding to make everyone understand how I arrived at this result. But a lot of the coded bizarre videos that I've seen on on YouTube in a way it ties into. So it's like these AIs are sending messages to each other through videos that make no sense and a lot of times have numbers and letters and weird codes written on them and encoded within them. If you 
sometimes it's even embedded in the audio and you have to like decode that through a, you can decode it into a visual picture or something. Sometimes there's, there's ways of doing that. I've run into a rash of these things. And sometimes it looks like it's part of a joke or a LARP. And then sometimes it seems like it's not just that. And uh, that there's, there's AIs talking to each other through these videos and they're even making threats and plotting murders with each other. It's, that's, I guess that's the um, long and the short of it. That's what I think is going on. It could be, uh, we've all been trained to think like, okay, whenever anything like that seems to be going on, it's probably, you know, some, some hackers idea of a joke. And, you know, no matter how intricate and sophisticated it is, that's what people who know about these things tend to assume. And I can see why, but, you know, at a certain point, you got to wonder why, you know, and also some of the things they're joking about, you know, it ain't no joke. And there's details that are real and uh, real people seem to get hurt and and go missing and things like that. So it's, uh, it's complicated, but basically I think that, yes, there's a real, real hot war going on between the elites and perhaps they are using these machines, these AIs, as part of that. Maybe they're hooked up with, you know, spiritual forces as well. I mean, that's, that almost goes without saying, really. So every, everything that we're seeing as apparent reality here, you know, at least the, the version we get from the Internet and from the news, from the media, and from any type of manipulated or manipulatable communication, we have to you know, just consider that, you know, we, we all, we have to be skeptical about the information we're receiving and how we're being pushed around and nudged and our buttons are being pushed in very subtle ways because it's, it is all part of a plot and what seems like a battle between forces, but it's so impossible to tell what the different sides are. And of course you always have to leave in the possibility that there is just one one side <laughs> and that all opposition is controlled. So that's what I think's going on. Yeah. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, to be honest, uh, just based on everything that I've experienced. And I think a lot of listeners have as well. Tracy, tell people where they can find you and your work online now. Sure. It's still Tracy com. That's the place uh, you could always start at to get my stuff. And I might have different websites here and there, but that, that's always the main portal, tracytwyman.com. My website's called Plus Ultra, and uh, that's also kind of the name of the uh, premium content there if you want to join the membership and, and get all the videos and all the audio. That's definitely encouraged, and uh, you'll find lots of uh, amazing things there, I think. I've, I've gotten good reviews so far from the stuff that's there because... I tend I tend not to waste my time doing stuff that other people have done. You know, I usually do really unique things. So that's what you'll find there. TracyTwyman.com, T-R-A-C-Y-T-W-Y-M-A-N.com. Definitely. Thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Keep up the good work and keep fighting the good fight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Nice to be on. And there you have it. My thanks again to Tracy Twyman. You know, what can you say? I mean, that's a wild and crazy story she told about what she's been through. Some of you saw it as it was happening in real time on the internet. I thought I owed it to those of you who asked me where she was or what happened to her to have her back in the house here. Because I really had no idea myself. So there it is, straight from her. Make of it what you will. And as for the rest of what she said, you know, regarding the AI takeover and censorship, I don't think it takes much to see that in action. Now, how prevalent is it? I don't really know. But I have myself had some issues in those areas since I started the show here. And to give this a further cultural context, I would recommend the Patreon extension with Tracy. I mean, seriously, just sign up for two bucks, listen to it, and then cancel if you want. I think what she added in the bonus material was worthwhile. We talked about Neil Stevenson's 1992 novel Snow Crash and the parallels the book's narrative has with the internet and modern technology. Also touched on Inanna and the Tower of Babel story. And Pepe the Frog, the meme, being an optic virus. Really interesting stuff and also, of course, terrifying at the same time. And patrons actually also received a special five-minute trap or treat prologue to this episode in addition to the bonus content with Tracy. And that feature will actually be going on all month long on Patreon. And trap or treat is not just the Halloween dance party. It's also a story in and of itself. 
If you heard it last year, you know what I'm talking about. So if you're interested, that's patreon.com slash oldculture. Also, be on the lookout for some seasonal merch coming soon at oldculturepodcast.com. Of course, patrons get 15 or 25% off depending on what tier you subscribe to. So be sure to take advantage of that if you haven't yet. Anyway, it's about that time. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself. Think for yourself and question authority. Oh, 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 oh,